All right, so here we go with another lecture on in Texas history on the other impresarios. And so when we talk about these other impresarios, there are quite a few uh, mediocre uh, and frankly failed impresario contracts throughout Texas uh, during the Mexican period and even after uh, t Mexico loses Texas and it becomes a republic, but especially during the, the Mexican period. Uh, in the previous lecture, we looked at uh, the Green DeWitt Martin de Leon colony, uh, but now we're going to go down down the coast a little bit. In fact, uh, hugging the coast, we're going to run down to uh, basically Matagorda Bay, south of Matagorda, down to Copano, and down to what we'll, what today we'd know as Corpus Christi. And there we're going to look at two colonies uh, that are going to be very related. And so uh, if you've been down that way, you probably have gone through a little old community, a little, it's a county seat, in fact, called Sinton, S-I-N-T-O-N. Now, I'm not going to ask you the name of the county seat uh, which, uh, of the county, but I might ask you the name of the county, and that county is called San Patricio County. Now, uh, you, may have, you may know that. Most of you probably don't, and I'm not trying to pick at you or anything, but uh, it's just a little old small rural Texas county uh, outside of Corpus Christi and Rockport, about 30 miles off the coast. Uh, flat, windswept, uh, still has a little bit of, uh, of that great grasslands for cattle and that sort of thing, but you're getting close enough to the coast that in some respects your, uh, your land is getting a little bit more uh, weedy. Uh, in a sense. But San Patricio County, uh, the name itself gives away who it was created for or who was down there. Uh, in English, it's St. Patrick. And if you think about it, who has the, is the patron saint uh, that has, or what nation has a patron saint of St. Patrick? Of course, that is Ireland. You're going to have a lot of several hundred, about four or five hundred Irish families move to South Texas in the 1820s and 1830s. You really have two colonial uh, efforts down in that part of the world, two contracts that are going to work. And we're going to pick up the first one, and that is the colonial effort of John McMullen and James McGloin. And in fact, the names themselves, McMullen and McGloin, uh, would just give it away. Anytime you get that Mick in there, uh, that is going to be probably an Irish, uh, an Irish family or some sort of, at least they got their name uh, from Ireland, even though after time it may have changed. But the thing is, is that McMullen and McGloin, uh, they are uh, recruiting and they are trying to draw in Irish settlers into South Texas there, there along the coast and back into the interior a little bit. The year is 1829, and uh, John McGloin and James, uh, John McMullen, excuse me, and James McGloin are going to go to New York City. See, in 1829, you're already starting to see the uh, beginnings of the great Irish migration to uh, the United States. Uh, it really picks up and goes into full flower in the 1840s, but even before the 1840s, there were Irish who were moving to the United States. McGloin and McMullen are going to uh, concentrate their efforts on newly arrived Irishmen living in New York City who really hadn't set down roots all that much. And so what they end up doing is, is that they end up recruiting several hundred over the span of their uh, contract. They set, end up recruiting several hundred uh, families to come to Texas. And at times, it is not as successful as you may hope. Uh, it is probably best described, McMullen and McGloin, as a, the, their impresario contract is a mixed bag. I've seen some describe it as a failure, and I have too uh, at previous points in my career as a teacher. I've reevaluated it a little bit, but I think it's uh, it fairly, it's a, it has its uh, moments of, the, of, of glory and moments of ignominy. The problem is, is that when we talk about the Irish being brought to Texas from New York, you're going to have a couple of uh, ships that come to Texas there in the f winter of 1829, and they're going to dump their, I say dump, but they're going to offload their cargo there along the Texas coast close to the port of Copano. And, and some of you um, have spent time either on vacation or on a fishing vacation at the little uh, town of Rockport. Others know Rockport because Harvey, three or so years ago, uh, crushed Rockport and went ashore right there. So anyways, uh, Rockport uh, in, is sitting on Aransas Bay, but right behind the present-day city of Rockport is Copano Bay. And there was a little, uh, a little uh, port there at, uh, at, on that uh, bay and estuary system called Copano in the 1820s and 30s. In fact, actually, if you were to, I'll say this and just get it out of the way, but if you were to come to Texas, you would come to Texas in about two manners, maybe three 
three manors before the uh, midpoint of the 19th century. One of the entry points into Texas was Copano. Another was up at the bra mouth of the Brazos River called Velasco. Today you know it as Freeport. And then, of course, also uh, over closer to present-day Houston, a little old town called Anahuac opposite the mouth of the Trinity River in Trinity Bay. So anyways, Anahuac, Velasco, and for us here in this lecture, Copano. Copano uh, is, is nothing to write home about. If you landed at Copano and you're doing trying to trade in Texas, uh, you would have to take uh, your, your, at least you were supposed to, you were uh, supposed to take your goods and pay taxes and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, tithes and such uh, to Mexico. After 1830, you would take it to La Bahia or Goliad. So anyways, but these uh, Irish uh, settlers are offloaded there along the coast. And the problem is, is, is that a lot of these settlers uh, are going to be ferried to Texas. These Irish settlers are ferried to Texas by English captains, English shipboat captains. Of course, in the 19th century, the greatest mariners uh, seemingly were all English. And uh, if you know anything about English and Irish history, as I might have said before to you, English and Irish history is not exactly a good uh, history of kumbaya, everybody get along in unity. Uh, ultimately, when you look at English and Irish uh, history, you, say, you look at it and you say, ah, the English, they really put the thumb down on the Irish and crushed them at times. So uh, it is not exactly a, a happy story. And in fact, in December of 1829, as some of these men and women are going to be set, trying to settle in, uh, in Copano and eventually move inland toward, uh, uh, well, we'd call it Corpus Christi, but move inland. They are going to be dumped with, by this English, the, one of the English shipboat captains who basically could care less. He'd already been paid. He didn't like the Irish anyways, and so what if they uh, get thrown off into a howling wilderness uh, with perhaps hostile natives in the neighborhood? And in a sense, this may be a replay of uh, Rene Robert Cavalier Sword de La Salle. Uh, you get off into the interior and you get cro crossways, or maybe Alonzo de Pineda, uh, get crossways with the Karankawa Indians. And so uh, these, uh, the problem for these uh, Irish settlers in Texas is that many of them uh, were uh, already in trouble uh, physically. Many of them had crossed uh, many wa uh, waters. Some recently got off the boat for, uh, in New York City from the Atlantic, then almost seemingly turned right around and came back, didn't have much money, weren't well fed, weren't well taken care of, and on I can go. So uh, all of which is to say is, is that moving to Texas could be harsh. Throw in windswept cold, uh, rainy and damp if you've ever been to the coast. 40 may not, 45 degrees may not feel, uh, you may not think is all that cold, but throw into a uh, so, the uh, dampness of the coast, maybe 40 degrees, and, you, and no real shelter, and uh, you've got problems on your hands. Some of the Irish who were uh, cast off at Copano or near the port of Copano in 1829 are going to be basically uh, on their own, and they've got to make a trek across land down toward uh, Corpus Christi. It's not Corpus Christi, it's not a town yet at that point, uh, but it soon will be. But anyways, they've got to trek that direction, and that is where they're supposed to go. Uh, the problem is they don't know where to go yet, and uh, they're kind of uh, forlorn. And uh, one of the things is in this, the way this story goes is there was this one Irish woman who was very pregnant, and she was uh, extraordinarily, uh, uh, extra when I say extraordinarily pregnant, she was ready to have a baby. She and a couple of, and a midwife or two go into the bush for some uh, privacy and some cover away from the main Irish uh, camp there shortly after being put off the boat. And she lays down, or she sits, uh, lays down, as I understood it, laid down to give, have birth. And she had, they had the baby. This girl, woman had her child. The midwives were wiping it off and out of the, uh, wiping the baby off, and out of the briar and the bramble comes this Karankawa woman. And you remember the Karankawa woman from earlier, Karankawa women, excuse me, from earlier in the semester. They were tall, they were impressive, and they had the potential to scare you senseless because of uh, uh, their presence and also their reputation for cannibalism. And so this woman, um, this woman is uh, going to have, this Karankawa woman comes out of the bush, literally takes the baby away from this uh, uh, Irish woman who's just given birth, this uh, mother. And so takes it away, runs off in the bush, and by gosh, everybody is like, what happened? What happened? Well, you're not getting, they didn't get that baby back. At least it seemed that way. 
And so, uh, you know, heartache and compounded by uh, famine, compounded by exposure, compounded by just a, a ba- seeming abandonment. And maybe they were thinking, some of these uh, Irish settlers in Texas were thinking, oh my, damned is the, I'm quoting basically an old I- Italian settler from, uh, or immigrant from Ellis Island, damned is the day I left my homeland, sort of thing. So, I mean, it's pretty bad. What are you going to do? Well, luckily for uh, the uh, Irish, other uh, Karankawa Indians uh, had traveled over to San Patricio, which is the capital or the territory where they're headed to, San Patricio to Ibernizia. And uh, these uh, these, uh, Karankawa Indians, uh, they communicated to McGloin and McMullen and basically said, oh, people like your people are here. And well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Because McMullen and McGloin were looking for these uh, settlers. Uh, there were supposed to be several hundred of them, and where are they? They haven't gotten here yet. They, they haven't turned up yet. And so uh, they basically said, uh, these uh, these uh, Karanko Indians said, oh, they're over there. We, we saw them. Uh, they've got hair, and it's on fire just like these guys are, which means red hair. That, that's the, uh, You'll see that described. In fact, actually, a funny story. Uh, it saved the man's life. Uh, was it Henry Wax Carnes? Uh, Carnes County is named for him. Years later, a few years later anyways, uh, he's going to be captured by the Comanche, and they tried to wash the fire out of his hair, and they couldn't believe it, and it, it saved his life in a strange way. So anyways, back to uh, the coast, uh, McMullen and McGloin, they go to the uh, Irish, uh, they find them there along the banks of the Copano Bay, basically, and they bring them back into San Patricio and start uh, start to uh, uh, get things back into motion. Well, that all sounds good, and in more particularly, though, you're going to see an act of kindness that breaks out amongst, uh, you know, humanity sort of thing. It's, you know, for all the differences we can point out, and you're this way, and I'm that way, and da-da-da-da, and almost like, uh, you know, this is my uh, creed and tribe, and this is my creed and tribe, and there we uh, separated, we shall ever be. Uh, there is also, at times in history, you will find these acts of uh, hum- common humanity, uh, and this is what it is. Because the, Kar- the Karankawa woman that had stolen that baby, that Irish baby, and carried her off into the bush and ran away, brought that child back when the Irish were about to leave and gave the child back to the mother and basically had saved the life of that child because the Karankawa woman had pity upon uh, that uh, child and a pity upon that woman and basically had come to the conclusion that woman, meaning the Irish woman, the mother, could not actually keep that child alive. And so she, this Karankawa woman, nursed that uh, child on her own breast uh, and saved that Irish child's life. It's really a sweet moment, in a sense, a a very humane moment for a tribe that at times uh, is very cruel and and, uh, bloodthirsty thirsty in their history, but at other times extraordinarily humane. So, you know, that's perhaps just being human uh, as it is. So all that to say is, is that the Irish had uh, back toward or headed toward their new land uh, to get uh, their titles and to start making a new life for themselves there along the banks of the Nueces River near present-day Corpus Christi. Again, their, that capital for McMullen and McGloin is going to be called San Patricio de Ibernizia. H is silent in Spanish, so it's Hiber. It looks like an English hibernitza, uh, but uh, anyways, you can look it up. San Patricio de Ibernitia, St. Patrick of the Irish. However, uh, at this point, you may be thinking, oh, it's going to be a happy ending just like a Disney movie. But we, we should know by this point in time, and if you grew up with these rose-colored glasses, I hope you I hope you are optimistic. I'm not always in about life because I'm a historian, I, and I, I'm a Calvinist at that. So uh, optimism does not run naturally to me. I, I try to be sunny, but sometimes I'm not. But if you are, more power to you. Uh, but you know as well as I do at this point, uh, or you should, and 2020 has a way of wringing these sorts of things out of us, these uh, unfounded optimisms, I would call it. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, you know life doesn't always turn out like you hope, and frankly, even the best plans go awry, and sometimes you can't do anything about your circumstances. It is what it is, to use a term. Uh, and so, you know, not every, even when you think the worst has happened, it can get worse. Sometimes it does, often seemingly not, but it can be worse. And so when we talk about these Irish settlers headed to McMullen and McGloin's capital in the area around uh, Corpus, today's Corpus Christi, Gregory, Portland, and that part of the world uh, where that colony is to be set up, 
uh, you would think at this point maybe things are going to look better, and perhaps they could. The problem is you're going to have a handful of Irish die on the trek over from Copano to San Patricio because they're all exposed, meaning exposed to the elements, and they don't have good food. They don't have good, uh, I mean, they've just been worn down and some die, so that's horrible. And then you may be thinking, oh, here we go, at least, well, now maybe it'll get better. But the next story is this, and it's, it's going to sound really good. Uh, the, uh, the Irish, uh, settlers, or excuse me, the Irish impresarios, uh, McMullen and McGloin had made contact with Madame Morris, Madame Morris, Mexico, down south of present day Brownsville, Texas, just on the other side of the Rio Grande to the Rio Bravo. And the thing is, is that when they, cr uh, they had made contact with Madame Morris and they had, uh, uh, approached what I'll use the slang term or the, the 20th century, 21st century term chamber of commerce, but they had approached the merchants and said, basically, we're setting up a colony and we want to trade with you. So it was, it's a mutual benefit sort of thing. And, and Madame Morris is uh, wise enough as a town, and the, the business leaders are certainly wise enough that they want to see this Irish colony succeed because it's uh, good, potentially good for business. And, oh, by the way, there, I didn't explicitly say this earlier, but the reason the Mexicans are inviting Irish into Texas is, is that if we can't get Hispanic Catholics to live in Texas, well, maybe we can get Irish Catholics to live in Texas, so the, the unifying theme would be the Catholicism, uh, and you don't have completely foreign individuals like uh, those uh, Anglo-Protestants that I talked about previously at, say, Green DeWitt or Austin's colony. So, uh, anyways, it was all, it, it, for several reasons, it behooves Madam Morris to, and it behooves Mexico, but behooves Madam Morris to help promote uh, this uh, McMullen and McGloin colony and the other Irish colony as well. So what ends up happening is in order to get this colony off the ground, Madame Morris sends some wagons full of food and supplies up to McMullen and McGloin's uh, area. And uh, at the town, there's a town today called Banketti, uh, just west of Corpus Christi on Highway 42 or something like that. You can check the maps. But it's just west of Corpus Christi by about 15, 20 miles. Some of you have been down that way before. Maybe you have. Uh, I've driven through Banketti once on the way to Alice, and I think that's the road that it goes to. But anyways, uh, you've been down that way hunting. Maybe you come from that part of the world, and you've driven there before. But Banketti, B-A-N-Q-U-E-T-E. -E. Now, Banketti sure sounds a lot like banquet in English, and that would be because it is. But Banketti... Banchetti is the site of this big banquet that was uh, given to the Irish or given uh, to the Irish by the Madam uh, Morris Merchants Association. That's my term, not theirs. But the idea was let us have a celebration, kind of a Thanksgiving. But unlike the Thanksgiving that uh, we read about and has been mythologized, uh, but, uh, the Plymouth Rock settlers and the local natives and all that sort of thing there, the thing is is that that Banchetti uh, settlement was, uh, or rather that Banchetti uh, event was a, a festival, the first order, but it doesn't turn out as well as you might think. Well, what happens is, is that, first of all, you're dealing with Irish who are, uh, frankly, fairly starved. Uh, and on top of that, these Irish are also going to be not only starving or having, have, not say starving maybe a bit much, but certainly on a, on a thin diet, on a very dry diet, a low calorie diet, not a rich diet. And so what happens is, is they bring out the best. The, the Matamoros Merchants Association sent rich foods, but more especially spicy foods and traditional Hispanic uh, foods. And I don't mean pre-prepared like in a box that you get at Raising Cane's, but uh, foodstuffs that you could prepare. And they were prepared, and what it does is it just causes gastrointestinal issues of the first order, makes many, many Irish sick, and kills more. You can tell this is really going to be a, uh, it's not exactly a momentous moment in Texas history. And it's not a propitious beginning uh, for this settlement. And then on top of that, the thing that I've pointed out to you several times that I'm pointing it out to you again, is that each of these colonies have to have uh, land commissioners. Land commissioners uh, arguably are more important than the impresario themselves because it is the land commissioner that's actually going to issue your title to your land. The problem, however, is, is that uh, a lot of these land, the land commissioners that were sent, supposed to be the commissioners for, in this case, McMullen and McGloin, well, they don't show up. The first one never showed up. The second one dies, and then the third one uh, 
doesn't uh, get there until time runs out, and so the contract isn't par- isn't properly fulfilled. On top of that, there was complaints later on now by the mid 1830s. So really, we're talking I should so years wise from 1829 to the, the outbreak of the revolution in 35, and there were complaints in the mid 1830s that the from McMullen and McGloin's uh, people that they were being uh, picked on and not being treated right by the Mexican government because of the lack of issuance of titles and such. And some of these uh, men and some of these women, some of these Irish settlers in McMullen and McGloin will ultimately pull up stakes and move to uh, the other Irish colony, Power and Hewitson. Power and Hewitson is just right up the road from there, and it's named for James Power and James Hewitson. Now, this too is an Irish colony. It is for Irish Catholics to create this uh, Irish colony in Texas with loyal Catholics who would be loyal to Mexico on the, with the commonality of uh, Catholicism. And uh, it, is a, uh, it is directed not toward Irish Americans, if you want to say, or Irish immigrants to New York City like McMullen and McGloin was. It is directed toward Irish uh, who are still in Ireland. Uh, this is designed to bring the Irish into Texas. I mean, literally uh, from the Emerald Isle sort of thing. The ca- uh, capital of uh, power in Hewitson is Refurio. And now, again, one of those things that if you kn- uh, know a community or know a state, you know and can f- uh, find out who the interlopers are or the visitors are by how they pronounce uh, words and so on. In Texas, you have several towns. Palestine is one, as I've said, Mejia. Others will say, Mexia. No, it's Mejia. And this is the other one, Refugio. So if you ever hear somebody say Refugio, you know they're not from Texas, or at least certainly not from, uh, they haven't traveled in Texas at all. They've just been uh, cloistered uh, wherever they're from. But Refugio is off of Highway 77. Uh, just as you're going south out of Victoria, you get on Highway 77 like you're going to the Corpus Christi or to the Valley. Uh, and so 77 sits there, and uh, it is, uh, Refurio's an old mission territory uh, as well. And so there was an old ruined mission that was uh, used at times for uh, as a capital in a building. But Refurio, Texas, uh, is the uh, headquarters of Power and Hewitson. Arguably, uh, McMullen and McGloin were more successful. Power and Hewitson, however, was more uh, able to give out titles. What happens, however, and this, is, uh, this story comes from my former office partner who's got family down that way. He said uh, to me, and, and Jeff Carroll's a, a good friend of mine, but he's gonna, when he dies, uh, they're going to, we're going to lose more Texas history uh, than you can imagine. He, he knows more uh, Texas history in one uh, part of his finger than I do in my whole bloody brain. So anyways, uh, the thing is, is that when you talk about uh, Power and Hewitson, and McMullen and McGloin, they're going to launch into a big old blood feud over uh, accusations of stealing colonists and this and that. It's really nasty, where when it's all said and done, nearly 100 people over the span of 100 years will be killed uh, in these fighting between the, these two sets of Irish or Irish-American settlers in South Texas along the Texas coast. I, some of, I mean, some of it's ridiculous. Uh, Jeff told me the story one time that if, when his grandmother died, uh, she had married into, how did it go? She had married, she was Power and Hewitson, and she'd married into McMullen and McGloin, and those two had, uh, uh, that had kind of uh, pinched off the rivalry for a while, something akin to Romeo and Juliet. Yet when Grandma died and everybody was there and the blood was still bad, frankly, because nobody forgot anything, nor did they learn anything, uh, Jeff talked about how he gave the eulogy at the uh, funeral. The Texas uh, Department of Public Safety was there. Some uh, local county cops were there. Uh, half the crowd, from grannies to young men, had guns on their hips, and they were all concealed at that point. Now, this has been about 1980, I guess. And the thing is, is that all that to say is, is that, uh, uh, yeah, Jeff uh, said it was quite the sight. And still, one person did get killed later that day or the next couple of days when he landed a plane in Carn City and things went suspiciously haywire. So those are the Irish colonies in, in South Texas, uh, again, of, I would say of mixed success. They got people here. Some folks got their titles to their land. Others didn't. And uh, it just depends on who you're ta- how you're talking about and who you're talking about depends on how successful it really was.
But now let's move our attention over to southeast Texas, over toward Beaumont and east of Houston, up into the Piney Woods. You're going to have three uh, different p colonies over there in that part of the world, that none of which are very successful. And frankly, it's really more of a land swindling operation. One of the things to best remember about Texas uh, colonial uh, setups and impresario setups is for every Green DeWitt, Martin De Leon, even McMullen and McGloin with their problems, uh, certainly Stephen Austin, you're going to have other men and women, and I'll get to the woman in a second, but you're going to have other men and women who are trying to set up colonies in Texas, and really they're in it for the land speculation, trying to get rich quick. You got some con men and, and uh uh, I guess you could say you got some con man and some uh, basically, uh, um, I'll say land thieves, land swindlers, if you want, uh, running around. And these next three kind of fall into that territory to some degree. And I've got to be careful because these three men aren't bad men. They're not like, uh, say, uh, Jim Fisk that you look at historically and it's like, that guy's just a, uh, he's as slippery as a bathtub of ills uh, filled with snot sort of thing. They're not that bad, but they have their moments. The three men are named Joseph Valine, Lorenzo de Zavala, and David G. Burnett. Of those three, you probably should have heard of the last two. Joseph Valine is a German. Lorenzo de Zavala is a Yorkino Federalist out of Mexico City who is speculating in Texas lands. And David G. Burnett is a future president ad interim of Texas in the Republic period, and he has, holds other offices and positions later on in life. Now, the thing is, is that uh, especially De Zavala, like I said, he's a Mexican politician, and in the case of Burnett, he's a bit of a filibuster, kind of a, a conniver. Uh, you know, the, the look at David G. Burnett, I just don't, I've never liked him historically. He just kind of comes off of his, this crusty old curmudgeon who was, uh, frankly, not that good. But the problem with these, this East Texas stuff is, is that it's East Texas. If you were looking to grow cotton in Texas, or if you're looking to get into the ranching or just other row crop, I'll call it row crop, but crop uh, industry or crop, uh, do, uh, you're looking to get into farming. The problem is uh, in East Texas is you've got too many trees. If you're going to try to farm in East Texas, you have got to cut down a whole lot of trees and you've got to clear a whole lot of land. It is a whole lot easier, friends, in 1825 or 1835 to get land, and it's a lot cheaper, too, that 12 and a half cents an acre stuff. Uh, but it is a whole lot cheaper to get land in central Texas, where there is a whole lot of grass and not, many, not nearly as many trees. And there's also good bottom land, like along the Brazos or the Colorado River. Heck, even the Guadalupe River is far, uh, in its bottom, is far uh, favorable to East Texas. So moving to East Texas was a, a real uh, problem. And so it, the, uh, the uh, impresarios, as uh, conceived, had trouble filling their contracts. Also worth noting as well is, is that those uh, impresarios, especially Lorenzo de Zavala, weren't planning on spending too much time in Texas. Uh, they, they found their interest elsewhere. They're, they're not as diligent. They're not as good as what you see uh, with Austin or DeWitt or De Leon. The thing is, is that uh, this is really ultimately going to end up being a land swindling operation because it violates the major tenets of the Mexican colonization laws that are on the books in Mexico and in Coahuila e Texas. Uh, why I call it a land swindling operation is because the, the uh, company that eventually gets these three grants and pools them together is called the Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company. Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company. Well, it violates the Mexican colonization laws for th in three ways. Number one, it says that that says you cannot, once you get a, a, a grant, you cannot you cannot pool these uh, grants with anybody else. You're supposed to be, in, a, in essence, an, uh, a, uh, a, I guess you could say an independent agent. A, not necessarily a free agent, but an independent agent in this uh, land uh, disbursement business. Number two. Secondly, the Mexican Constitution of 1824 and subsequent pieces of legislation backing it up or uh, bolstering the Constitution said no uh, corporation could operate in the, Uni in the United States of Mexico or Mexico uh, or for, obviously for that matter Coahuila, Texas, unless they were chartered in Mexico. Uh, 
The Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company is chartered in the United States of America, more particularly New York State. And last but not least, if you're talking about these impresario contracts and if they are to be done correctly and legally, you were supposed to give them a deed and a title. If you were to set when you were selling that land for, by the impresario through the land commissioner and the, those surveyors, you gave them a title. But what happens, and this too violates the law, is, is that the Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company, based in New York City, advertising in the eastern United States, is going to start handing out and selling land script, land uh, certificates. And what that is, is it's a promissory note. It says is that if you buy, it's almost like a, uh, it's almost like a uh, timeshare or something of that nature. Basically, if you buy this uh, script, if you buy this land certificate, take it to Texas, move to Texas, and there's going to be waiting for you 2,000 acres. There's going to be waiting for you 3,000 acres. Uh, it's not the 4,428 that we've talked about before. Uh, it, it, it breaks out differently, and that too is illegal. So it causes a whole lot of uh, lawsuits, causes, causes a whole lot of problems and headaches. Uh, some of it's been untangled. Most of it has, of course, by this point in time. Even uh, occasionally you still hear rumbles of the old Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company. Uh, that one was, uh, it, it one was a, me a mediocre uh, success and frankly more of a, a failure than anything else. Then uh, we move up the road now. We're going to get the last two uh, colonies taken care of, and we'll wrap up today. The thing is, the last two colonies worth noting here are right close to where we are. Uh, I sit, as I'm recording this, in the Barndo Minium Bunker uh, in beautiful Snook, Texas. But right up the road from here is Highway 21, which also at times has been El Camino Real, which is also known as Old San Antonio Road. Or if you're in San Antonio, they called it the Nacogdoches Highway. Well, my point is this, in my part of the world, right around here, you're going to go up the road just a little bit, and you're going to uh, cross into either Milam County or Robertson County. Robertson County, more particularly, is named for the, uh, the impresario in the, the, uh, just north of Austin's colony. Uh, it, it fronts up on the Little River, it fronts up on the Brazos River, the San Gabriel, and runs basically to the edge of McLennan County. Uh, and uh, the man who is going to be the impresario, the guy's name is Sterling Clack Robertson, Sterling Robertson. Two colony, those two colonies are going to have uh, capitals uh, worth noting. One is uh, Saraville to Nashville. Excuse me, Sarah, uh, let me see if I've got that written down here. Excuse me. First one is going to be Saradil de Viesca, which is actually Marlin today. And then second one is Nashville, which is much closer to here. Uh, Marlin is up on Highway 6, halfway to Waco, base, or actually two-thirds of the way to Waco on Highway 6 from where we are. And then um, Saraville or Nashville, excuse me, is on the Brazos close to today's Hearn, Texas. But anyways, all that to say, though, is, is that uh, if you look at the map of uh, Burleson County, how they lay out the line, lines on the league lines and, you know, giving out these parcels of land to this guy and to that guy. And I've got the, the map on the wall here in my office. I'm looking over at it right now. You can see the problems with Sterling Robertson right away. Robertson oversold. He over uh, overgranted. Uh, his uh, legal work was sloppy, uh, prone to quarrels. Uh, he was uh, far more interested in uh, basically getting rich quick. Uh, he was one of the uh, lesser quality impresarios to get your hands on. Now, most of the people who are in and Robertson's colony are going to be Anglo. They're going to be from the Upper South, that sort of thing as well. Well, the last uh, colony I want to mention to you it really never gets off the ground. It, it was part of a speculative venture out of New York City. A lot of land speculators out of New York City are found in Texas and elsewhere uh, in this time period. And that is the colony that had been secured, or at least thought to be secured, by a guy named Robert McManus. Well, Robert McManus is, a net, to my knowledge, he only comes to Texas for a little bit of time. But his sister is far more fascinating. His sister, who's going to spend a lot of time in Texas, uh, her name is, and I would write this down because she's really going to be the agent that tries to pull it all together. She's found all over the place uh, in the revolutionary, in the post-revolutionary period in Texas, uh, trying to uh, handle land grants uh, and sell land and, and populate Texas. Her name is Jane McManus Storms Casnew. Jane McManus Storms Casnew. Born in 1807, she comes to Texas in 1835. So she's uh, just a hair older than you ladies are or gentlemen are who are watching this. 
Uh, fascinating. She's from New York State, up, uh, mid-state New York, just up north of New York City. Uh, those who saw Jane said she would raven uh, black hair, uh, dark eyes, just a kind of all, olive complexion. Uh, don't have a real good picture of her, frankly. Uh, so I would say probably don't have a picture of her, but it, she was described as a beauty uh, with that raven hair. Uh, but uh, she was married at age 18, and like a lot of 18-year-old marriages, uh, it did not work out so well. Uh, she was also noted for, in her mid-20s, having uh, taken up and had an affair with a 65-year-old man named Aaron Burr, the same v- former vice president who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Uh, and it's been mentioned before about in his, uh, it was Burr who tried to pilfer his uh, ex-wife's, uh, and I think it was the same ex-wife that Jane's mixed up in. It's, it was convoluted. It's like a soap opera. Anyway, she was accused in divorce proceedings, uh, Jane was, of being the mistress to Aaron Burr. So there you go. Uh, So anyways, when she's in her late 20s, early 30s, you find Jane down here in Texas, and you find her along the Texas coast uh, trying to uh, secure grants. But more particularly, her grant was her brother's grant, I should say, but she was the agent who's handling the thing or trying to during the revolutionary period. Uh, Her grant is up around Waco. Uh, so basically, if you want to think about it, Stephen F. Austin, maybe you got his grant down to the coast all the way up to El Camino Real, and then you got Robertson's grant, and then just north of that at present-day Waco, more or less, is going to be the, uh, the McManus grant. I, ultimately, the, the problem for them was is that the, the revolution wrecks it all, and it's the, the, all this impresario stuff kind of really goes out the window after the revolution was over. Uh, and so what the Mexican practice was, was not completely abandoned, but somewhat abandoned afterwards. The reason McManus Storms Casnew is a fascinating character isn't because she was a failed impresario uh, who spent time in Texas uh, for a while living under a house, other times acting as a nursemaid or whatever, uh, but you find her as a writer. She was uh, published in numerous uh, newspapers in, in North America during the 1830s and especially the 1840s. And uh, in addition to speculating in land, she's going to live in, t- in around Eagle Pass. She's kind of a founding mother of the city of Eagle Pass, Texas, and lives there in the 1840s uh, with her husband. Let's see if I get the right husband name now, because she was married a handful of times. Uh, she was married to uh, William Storms, and that caused a divorce. And then, um, let's see, William Leslie Casnew was her other husband. And that's who was in Eagle Pass. According to a historian that I I know, uh, he basically said that uh, they had an open marriage and it caused a lot of issues in Eagle Pass. Uh, Open marriage meaning uh, it was okay to have uh, boyfriends and girlfriends sort of thing. But anyways, she is also going, she, Jane, isn't just going to have an interesting uh, marital life, but she's not just going to be a land speculator in Texas. You're going to find her having meetings with presidents of the United States. She will meet, and in fact, I should use the word demand. Jane, in her lifetime, will demand meetings with Jefferson Davis, uh, Franklin Pierce, uh, James Buchanan, uh, James K. Polk, Maybe I'm forgetting another president in there, but she gets them. She goes to the White House. During the war with Mexico, she's going to act as a... agent and a go-between for the U.S. government and the Mexican government. Uh, she is an advocate of expansion. She's an advocate of uh, taking Cuba. She was an advocate of taking all of Mexico during the war with Mexico. Uh, and then you find her everywhere, it seemingly. And so she is uh, going to live at times in the Dominican Republic. She's going to live in Texas. I mean, that for a woman who, uh, who seemingly didn't have that much, this woman's... Uh, you know, when the wind blew, she gone. She moved. She was, uh, I mean, she lived an extraordinarily active life. And then she dies in 1878, and she dies in a shipwreck uh, in the Bermuda Triangle. So uh, her life is, in a sense, fascinating. It would be, uh, and oh, almost forgot this. According to some, I don't know if I believe this, but I'll say it anyways because this is Texas history, and you might as well take the credit if you can. Uh, according to some, Jane McManus Storm Casnew was the author and the coiner of the phrase "manifest destiny." Whether it's true or not, well, well, maybe uh, we'll find out later on. But the thing is, is that I'll say it's true for a Texas history class. And so the term "manifest destiny," which means the United States has a God-given right to go from sea to shining sea. And maybe take all of Mexico if you're talking about Jane McManus Storm Casnew and others like her. 
that was uh, supposedly her her uh, coining, her phrase that she used. So, anyways, the impresario period of Texas is a mixed bag. So you boil it all down, you had the very great, uh, or the great and the very great, such as the Stephen Austins of the world, the very good, and this now is really more of an assessment sort of thing, the good and, and uh, near great, if you like, uh, colonist uh, over at uh, Gonzales with Green DeWitt and then Martin De Leon's at Victoria and his family's operation there. And then you go down from there to the Irish, and then you go to some of these failed ones that you find, and some that I just didn't even talk about. Uh, the old goal, though, was to get uh, settlers to Texas, and they are somewhat successful. Because by the time you get to the Texas Revolution, by the time you get to 1835-36, you're looking at Texas that's going to have approximately 30,000 individuals in it. And I should hasten to add at the very end here, now maybe I should have said this, I frankly should have said it earlier when I talked about Grant Green DeWitt and the Austin's calling, is as the issue of slavery in Texas has often been talked about as one of the causes of the Texas Revolution. Could you have slaves in Texas? The answer was technically, especially after 1825 in Mexico, could you have slaves in Texas? The answer is technically no. But because you also had uh, uh, indentured servant contracts, uh, basically these uh, southern settlers who had slaves and brought them to Texas with them, uh, uh, brought them to Texas and, and compelled the slaves uh, to sign lifetime indentured contracts. The Mexicans were fine with that. Uh, at times I have heard over the years... Um, People say that Texas' uh, revolution was caused by that. Were there people here trying to promote slavery in Texas? Oh, certainly. One of the more uh, prominent names in Texas revolutionary history is a fellow named James uh, W. Fannin, who's a real zero as far as a military commander. But there does seem to be a lot of evidence that uh, Fannin was over here taking orders for slaves to be imported into Texas. Uh, also, as far as Mexico is concerned, Mexico had slavery prior to 1825. But to be uh, clear, Mexico abolished slavery in 1825. Uh, it was not uh, terribly controversial. Uh, from what I've read o about it over the years, and the reason it wasn't controversial is because you already had a, a labor system in the uh, the uh, remnant of the encomienda system, the patron peon system. So you didn't really, uh, you really didn't have to have slaves uh, to do what they're doing, and, and also a little bit just different culture too, and different practices. You don't have the cotton breakout like you do, which really fuels slavery's expansion in the South uh, in the uh, post uh, in the early 19th century. So all that to say, though, is that slavery at at least uh, whether it may not be in, fa in form in the sense that it is a legal institution in Texas, but slavery was there, uh, and on top of that, uh, but it was a fact on the ground. You had more than a few slaves uh, living in Texas, even if they weren't called that. Most people, to be clear, do not have slaves when they move to Texas. They don't have them. Uh, most have one or two. And then you have other examples like a Jared Gross. Uh, and his, uh, when he came, he brought his, he moved to Texas and went the whole hog. Uh, he had, I think, close to 100 when he moved to Texas. But the Mexicans, especially early on in the 1820s, were all too happy to see uh, people moving to Texas, and they were willing, the Mexicans were, to, uh, to overlook uh, any complaints, any issues like slavery, for example, uh, that might have violated law because, well, frankly, the Mexicans, when they, especially Mexico City. Uh, when Mexico City was looking at Texas, they wanted to populate it, and they were willing to put up with a lot to get it done. They got it done. Problem is, though, is, is that not everybody who moves here is ultimately going to be loyal to Texas. Uh, the early settlers, the old 300 types, those people who were here in the 1820s and had laid a, a long set of roots, 10 years' worth of roots by the time 35 rolls around, they weren't as interested in war and, and revolution as were the, the young hotheads and the folks who just moved here lately who didn't have that much to lose. So it's really, when you talk about the coming of the, uh, the end of the impresario period and the, and the settlement of Texas, and now we turn ourselves toward the coming of the Texas Revolution, uh, it's frankly a little complicated, and it's not as simple that everybody went raw, raw to war in 1835. So we leave it there. We'll move on and we'll pick up other uh, subjects next time. We'll go to the revolution. That's where we are next. Bye.